I'm going to be real with you guys. Uh, this video is going to be a little bit different because I filmed it all this morning and I wanted to take a bike ride and edit it all. And I ended up leaving without really reviewing much of the footage. And when I got to the coffee shop that I was going to edit it at, I realized that it was all out of focus. Uh, it looked terrible. And um, yeah, so it's going to be a little bit different. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. I'm going to try to make it a little bit more fun than my normal, uh, you know, in front of this poster kind of video. And uh, I hope you enjoy. There are stories you may have heard of a car so wicked that it had to be locked away so that it could never hurt anyone again. I'm not talking about the Porsche Turbo. I'm not even talking about the Toyota MR2. This car never killed anybody. What it did kill was the spirits and the wallets of its owners. And now, I own one. So the story starts back in October in the middle of a pretty strict lockdown here in the Maritimes. My parents were at home trying to keep themselves entertained. During that time, my mom was getting pretty into hiking and she was going on hikes all over the place. And I believe it was a hike on uh, the southern shore where they came across a barn. Of course, the others were getting all sorts of artsy with it and taking photos with the barn and landscapes and that sort of thing. And I don't know why, but for some reason, mom went up to this barn and peeked inside. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw this red sports car and immediately started taking photos of it, sending them to me, asking what it was. It's a day you always dream about. You either read about it, you hear about it, or you watch a YouTube video about it. But you never think that it'll happen to you. If you know me, you know that there are two 90s Japanese legends that I have always wanted. They're two of my dream cars. One is a JZA80 Toyota Supra, as you've seen in my other videos, the poster on my wall. And the second is a pre-facelift or early generation Mitsubishi GTO. Now I say pre-facelift or early generation because uh, the GTO later on didn't retain its pop-up headlights and some of the models didn't retain their all-wheel steering, uh, active aero was thrown out. So a pre-facelift is the one that's on my list. My parents tracked down the previous owner via the family that still lived, lived on that property and uh, what we came to find out was that the owner had moved to Alberta with no plans of returning and no plans of taking the car back. What we also found was that the car had sat completely untouched in this garage for six years. It still had all of the original importation documents in the glove box as well as the completely untranslated Japanese documents that had come with the car when it was originally brought into uh, Canada. We actually contemplated on whether or not this car was ever worth bringing back in the first place. See, even though the car was essentially given to us, the cost of a truck and the cost of actually getting this thing back on the road posed a serious question to the legitimacy of this find. The GTO and the entire 3000 GT series for that matter is kind of known for its quirkiness and its sporadic reliability and we didn't know if it was worth taking the chance on this specific car. Some of the things to note about the car was that when my mom found it, it had a cracked windshield, it had broken rear glass on the hatch, uh, the wheels were locked on, you couldn't see underneath the car because the dirt and the sawdust and stuff that was in the floor uh, came up pretty high, the wheels were kind of sunken in, and uh, from what we knew, the car didn't start, and the previous owner said that he believed that it was an ECU issue. We later found that out to be false. But the initial mention of ECU problems at all made us extremely wary because GTOs and 3000 GTs are known for their extensive computers, and uh, that scared us a little. After a few hours of deliberating, speculating as to the cost of this car, and what the parts were going to cost, and all that sort of thing, we decided that the car was worth it. With the wheels locked on, there was a lot of trouble getting the car out of the barn and then into our garage. Luckily, with the winch and the skills of the guys involved, they managed to get it out of the barn and into the garage without even touching any of the really good paint that was left on this car. When the car actually got to the house is when the real work started. See, you rarely see the work that goes in, into it in between the time when the car is actually found and when people start working on it, but there's actually quite a lot. This situation was a little bit different where, of course, we weren't prepared for a barn find to show up. So my parents had to get to work very quickly, making room so that the car could go into the garage and stay there for an extended period of time. You have to remember that, like I said, the wheels were locked on, it was late in the year, winter was coming, and at the same time, the furnace in our garage was broken. 
during COVID, it was really hard to get anybody to come in and fix it. So we knew that the car was gonna have to sit there for an extended period of time while also needing enough room to be able to maneuver around it in order to fix the furnace. Due to COVID, I had absolutely no way of getting home. So everything that I'm about to talk about, all the work that's been done to it has been completed by my dad, my uncle, and my pop helped out, which was really cool. So they started by getting the car put up on blocks. The first thing that they wanted to do was being able to get the wheels uh, turning, get the axles freed, make sure that the brakes are all freed up. So like I said, they were all locked on. And uh, once they got it up on blocks, that's pretty much where it stayed for a few months due to the fact that we still didn't have any heat in the garage. Getting the axles freed up, of course, had to be done before we could even attempt to get the car started. Uh, starting a car in a garage with no way of rolling it out is way too risky, especially when it's something that's completely untested. And especially because all of my other cars are also in that garage. Once they were freed up, we actually determined that the brakes on the car were new. Granted, they were new six years ago, but we also determined that the car had only been driven about 600 kilometers when it got to the island, likely when they put these new brakes on. There had been a lot of work done to this car since it landed on the island and before quickly being given up on. And one of the things that was actually done to the car was a brand new Borla exhaust that still looks phenomenal. The battery was obviously dead, but my dad actually distilled some water uh, and then put it into the battery, filled it back up, and then put it on a battery tender. And when he tested it out, everything started to come alive. Normal maintenance was completed and fluids and oil and that sort of thing were changed and then inspected to make sure that we weren't walking into an already losing battle. With everything checked out, the car was now ready to be started or at least attempted to be started. So the car was pushed out into the driveway and with some new gas, a hope and a prayer, it started. And it started on the first flick, the same as every other car I've ever owned. And I don't know if this is just good luck or if we just find really good cars. <laughs> I do have a video here that I'll play of the car starting up. Uh, it's pretty bad quality, but you get the point. It's shot on my dad's old iPhone and you can actually hear how excited he is about the car starting in the video. The deciding moment. Is this piece of shit going upstairs? Hey, Puff Troyer. Anyway, right after the car started, uh, Dad found that the throttle linkage was actually stuck. Uh, it had seized on, I guess, over time. So he soaked it in penetrating fluid overnight, and then the next morning he came out, fired it up just like he did the day before, uh, and when he gave it a couple of revs, everything worked. Everything was all freed up. Uh, it's also worth noting, too, that the car not only started, it idled fine, and after it warmed up, it dropped down to about 800, which is pretty much right on. So that's pretty much the story right now. Uh, once they get more vaccines and they're able to fire those borders open, uh, I will likely be able to get some better content for you guys, more high quality content, more in-person stuff with the cars. But uh, hopefully for right now, you're enjoying these kind of story times, that sort of thing about the cars. Uh, in the short period of time that I've owned Japanese cars, I've had a fair amount of pretty cool experiences. So I like to be able to share those and uh, also gives me something to do car related in the meantime while I'm stuck on this island where I don't have any of them with me. So like I said, uh, if you've been enjoying these kind of story time videos that I've been making in the meantime, uh, please give this video a like, uh, subscribe if you're new. Uh, my name is Nick, I'm the founder of Bayshore Boys, the channel. You can also catch me on Instagram. And I've been a Japanese car enthusiast for as long as I can remember. Uh, I'm mostly into Toyotas and every now and again we find an old Mitsubishi in a barn but uh, hopefully you guys stick around for more adventures like I said the videos will get better once COVID clears up a little bit more and they can start getting those land borders open but uh, I hope you stick around and I hope you liked it thanks Fire's going I got my neck what can I say I'm reading my scripts cause my memory's not that great